Well, thanks for being here for MixCon. This is our second one ever. I'm glad to see so many new faces, a couple of familiar ones, and such a, a filled up room for it. I want to get done talking and introduce a guy who's much more important than I am. I'm going to say his name and I want you to applaud for him. He's a very cool dude, Mr. Frank Philpenny. Thank you. Uh, Frank has been doing this a long, long time. I mean, he's worked with everyone from James Taylor to Korn. You know, he has been more recently working on a whole bunch of uh, cast recordings for Broadway, uh, Book of Mormon, which is uh, very cool. He's worked with Kiss. He's worked with uh, Elton John. I mean, it's just all over the map. If you look at music history for the past 30 or 40 years, Frank has been there for it. We'd really like to thank Isotope for sponsoring this panel. They've made it possible for us to make this video free to the public, and they made it possible for us to allow you guys to come here free. I mean, no tickets, no charge. So very many thanks to Isotope. <laughs> so without further ado, one more round of applause, Mr. Frank Philpenny. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So let's go to mixing. When I get a song in, the first thing I do uh, is I listen to it with nothing on it. I listen to it, I uh, generally, I don't even put up their rough mix, I don't want to hear what they've done. I want to just spend 10 or 15 or 20 minutes with the song just to get an idea of what I think is going on. I want to get a rough mix up of just the tracks with no effects, no EQs, no nothing. If they bring me in a Pro Tools session, I take off all the effects. Don't want to hear it. Right now, I just want to concentrate on the song structure, on the music, on the way the band or the musicians are playing together. So let's take this song here. This is a song I recorded last year. And think about this as if you were the mixer. Think about, I, I did a quick little rough mix and just think about where, uh, what you might think, uh, or what you might do with this if, if it's handed to you. Yeah. This is where the tracks start, right here. There is, this is the inserts, those are sends, but the sends are just, um, sends I have my template, they're not on. They're going to effects that are turned off, but you'll see there's no, nothing here. Uh, that shouldn't be there. Now these here are just um, part of my template. They have nothing to do with the tracks themselves. They're just some things, we'll go through this in a minute, but they're subgroups where I've added some processing. But other than that, all the effects are off. Do it 
Okay, so that's basically the song. So let's go here. Now, uh, the, the very first thing, once I've got the tracks in and I've got my, my uh, actually even before I put the rough mix together, you got to organize your session, especially if you haven't recorded the session. If it comes in from someone else, you have to organize it. It's just, it's crazy if you have your you know, the snare drum here, and then the guitar, and then a keyboard, and then the, the overheads here or something. You want to consolidate all this. Now, I have a template that I use, but I'm saying not just organize them according to instrumentation, but also organize them with color. Also organize them, in the way I do this, with VCAs. So, if I want to just solo the drums, you know, I don't have to solo each drum, I just, you know, I'm soloing the bass, or... So, I've organized them all. Now, if you had my console up here, uh, I'm not sure if this is doable on a laptop, but with Pro Tools, what they, they have this really neat feature on the Pro Tools consoles where you can, if you solo this, you can spill it out in front of you. So even though you may only have 24 or 32 faders in front of you, you have the whole orchestra in front of you because if you solo the guitars and hit spill, it spills it across the uh, however many, many faders you designate right in front of you. So the beauty of that is when you do something like 200 motels where I had 200 tracks and it took like, you know, just scrolling from the top to the bottom gave me tennis elbow. You know, it's, it's just, it's ridiculous, but you have nothing you can do about it. Those are the tracks. So basically by having the spill function unlike on an analog console where track 199 would be in Manhattan compared to where we are here, this actually sets all these by, by setting up your VCAs, it sets it all right up in front of you. One of the real joys and beauties of the digital mixing system versus the analog. Set up your whole structure. Now again, I do this for a living. I do it seven days a week. Um, I've learned these things over the years, but I'm trying to say to you, I had to learn some of these things the hard way. And the hard way was trying to find tracks or mixes or things five years later, you don't even remember doing it, let alone where you put it, okay? One of the things that I've learned to do in organizing, because I'm usually terrible at it, but I've come up with a system over the years, and my system now is basically, I put a number in front of every song that I do. Especially when you're working with 12 songs or something like that as part of an album. Just arbitrarily label them, one through 12, or whatever it happens to be. Doesn't matter where they're gonna be on the record, just label them. It's so much easier to sort things to find things later. If you've gotta find that particular song and a whole list of songs, you sort and you know exactly where it's gonna be. So I put, a label, I put a number 01 through 99 in front of the song. Second thing I do is then I label it with the name of the song, not the whole name. You could have seen me when I was 17. It takes too many characters. At the end of the day, you know, when you start labeling mixes and stuff, you're going to have things way too long, especially with the path name in front of it. It's ridiculous. So just say party. This is called party, okay? 03 space party, 
Then I have a number. Number again from 0 to 100, basically or 0 to 99. This number denotes how many passes. What pass is this? Okay, why do I denote that? Well, it's very simple. Many times I'll get a call from someone saying, you know that mix you sent me, mix 1.33? Yeah, it's all right, but I really loved 09. You know, the first mix you did, pass 09. It was the ninth pass, okay? So I just go back, and every time I do a new pass, I save it with that number. And I print, if I'm printing a mix, I print the mix with that number. So it's mix 09. So now if I've got to go back and find, I don't have to sit there, sort by dates, and find out what day did I do that. It's pass 09. I go back. See pass 09 there in the old sessions file, bring it up, and there it is, and I start from there, okay? Now, so basically, now this is zero, 00. This will go to zero, 00 up to 99 is before I do my mix. This is me experimenting. When I'm ready to send the first mix to my artist, that becomes one point, whatever the next mix is. So let's say at mix, uh, zero 09, I decide this is good enough, I'm going to print it now and send it to the artist. It becomes not 10, it becomes 1.10. First pass, mix 10. Okay? When I get feedback from the artist, they say, uh, I, I love it, but I'd like you to do this, this, or this. Now, my next pass may be. Um, 11, 12, 13, but now instead of 1.11, 1 1.12, 1 1.13, when I send it to them, the next one is 2.13, 3.15, and that way. So you'll always know what pass you're on as well as how many passes it took to get there. Okay, so this is pass 00, zero because I've done this. This is my first rough mix. There's no effects, there's no EQs, there's no nothing. These EQs and these inserts that you see here are from my template. Now, what are these? Well, these are very simple, and, and I'll get into explaining this bus structure a little bit more later, but basically the bus structure works like this. We start with drums, guitars, bass. We've now color-coded them and organize them. So here's my color coding. These are the vocals. So vocals are red or reddish. Uh, these are the background vocals. They're slightly purplish. Um, those other things are other coding you don't need to know about now. But then the drums, then the bass, then the green is, is reserved for guitars, okay? And then the uh, this, slightly off red color here is reserved for the percussion. That's basically all there is on this. So, but when I take the drums, I not only VCA them, but now the drums get output to a drum bus, okay? That's this right here. This is the drum bus, and you can see there's stuff on there. Now, what's on there? Well, I have, this is from my template, okay? I have a decapitator on there from Sound Toys. Um, the Capitator is a wonderful little tool for just adding a little bit of analog crunch or something to your mix. Now see, this is what's great about digital. Analog, you have no choice on whether it crunches or not. It does, okay? Not only that, but you have no choice as to whether it compresses the transients or not. It does. Anyone who's tried to record a tambourine at anything higher than minus 20 knows what that crunch is. Now, sometimes that crunch works okay on a snare drum or a bass drum. That's why we sometimes do a little compression on them, okay? Well, why do we compress in the analog world? Why do we compress a bass drum or a snare drum? It's already compressing. Well, that's not what we do. See, what we do is, because analog tends to, tends to remove the front end and give you more of the back end, what we do in analog mixing is try to reverse that process. 
Very seldom do we try to make less front end on a snare or less front end on a bass drum. Usually what we're trying to do is get some of that back that the tape has wiped away. So what do we do to do that? Well, we use a very slow attack time and a very fast release time. Okay, what does that do? Well, what that does is it lets that thing that's been, that's been chopped off by the tape, okay, at the attack, it lets that through, and then it cuts it down later so it's, it sounds like an attack or it simulates an attack, but just like simulated sex isn't really satisfying, so simulated attack is not either. Okay, the bottom line is that basically we're doing this to give it more crack or more front end because the analog has wiped it away. Unfortunately, digital gets a bad name because a lot of engineers go to digital and they do the same thing. Well, you've really screwed it up now because if you do the same thing in digital, digital has all that front end. Now suddenly you got more front end than you can possibly deal with. That does two things. One, it makes it sound thin. And two, it brings your level down. Because in digital you're using peak meters, it brings your level down another 6 dB. So the whole thing is much smaller than analog. So when you compare them, you say, God, analog sounds so much bigger. Yeah, well, it's 10 dB louder. But if you didn't do that, and you, did, and you did the same processing to both, you'd find that digital kills it. In any event, my opinion, okay? So I've got that on here. It's just a flavor. It's a touch of something, okay? It's a rock and roll track, so it's not a rock track, it's a pop rock track, so I'm adding just a little bit of scrunch to the, to the drums. I'm adding a touch of EQ, uh, to the to the drums, I found this this is just a good general. It's about a it's about a dB at the low end, a dB at the top end, and maybe because it's a drum kit, a little you know about a, a three quarters of a dB. It's but it's very minor, okay. But that's in my template, and the reason I have that is just I've just found and the same thing with the bass. I have the bass. I'm going into just a touch of of uh, uh, compression, because we like the, we like a little bit of that on the bass, and maybe adding just a touch of low end, about three on a pull tech, okay? But basically, these are just real slight changes in EQ that I've put on the template, because I don't want to start EQing all of my tracks. I've learned over the years that there are certain, you know, there are certain EQs that you invariably go to, so I've just put that in my template. And every time I call up a rock track, I go to the rock template, and those are already set up for me. So basically, all the drums go into the drums, all the, the basses go into the bass, guitars into guitars. Um, the acoustic guitars, what are we doing? We're doing a little bit of decap, okay, for the acoustics. Um, we're using a little bit of this Chris Lord Algae uh, plug-in from Waves, which... Uh, um, it's just adding a little, tut, uh, little bit of uh, sparkle, and then the old standby for acoustic guitars, a DBX-160, okay? Um, electric guitars, um, everybody's old favorite, the LA-2A, okay? And again, as you can see, the amount of peak reduction is almost non-existent. It's just for a, a little flavor. Um, in any event, uh, keyboards, we're using a little bit of the decapitator, percussion, just the decapitator, and just a little bit of a tube, just to add a little tube schmutz to, uh, to the uh, uh, percussion. And then finally, there's the room track. The room track I'm just sending to a limiter just to add a little bit of something. This is the Avid um, uh, Pro Limiter. Okay, so that's basically all that's going on. Um, and, uh, oh, background vocals, there is one thing that I use in the background vocals. That's a thing uh, Steve Katz made. You will find later as we go through the mix that this is, this is where I'm starting, but, by, but in a couple of sections, I move this down to here. What is this doing? This is adding ambience. 
this does some kind of mathematical magic and I've automated it in a couple spots. I'll show you where that is and uh, to add some, some ambience to the track. So that's basically it. I've had, I have a, a bunch of what I call subgroups that each instrument goes to and there's just very minimal processing on each of the groups. But that in itself allows me, as you can see, there's nothing except for these sends. If we just go to the, let's go, uh, we get rid of the sends themselves. And so basically you're seeing here on the tracks, there's nothing. And you'll find that once we get later on, you're going to find it's still nothing, okay? Because this little processing here is all I really needed to do. The tendency nowadays, because you can, you do. And people start adding plugins and plugins and plugins and plugins and plugins, and you end up having all these things fighting each other. So basically, now, these subgroups then get subbed, okay, to another group. Those groups are going to two master groups. One is a vocal master and one is an instrument master. Why do I do that? Well, there's really one main reason, especially in a rock track. In a rock track, you got a lot of upper mid frequencies. The guitars, the, the keyboards, the drums, the cymbals, a lot of things and the voice all fighting for those areas, okay? So basically what I do is I have a, um, a vocal master, okay, where I send all the voices. And as you can see, it's, again, as, as in everything that I do, it's very subtle, okay? There's just ever so much a slight presence peak here on the vocal, really minimal, okay? And then on the uh, instrument track, this is done because on the rock tracks, I like a little of that kind of 40, 50 hertz thing. Uh, it looks like a big bump, but it's really only about 2 dB. Um, but again, right here, you'll see I've carved out just a little bit in that same middle area and another spot around the 5K area, just so that the vocal lives and has, you know, it's not being fought against in those, in those ranges. Now, Every song, now this says uh, instrumental party, that's the way it was saved. Every song will have its own version. Sometimes uh, I may get rid of this. Uh, many times I'll get rid of this because this happens to work in this particular song, but may not in another. In any event, the idea being that just a little bit of this to carve out the frequencies a little bit, not of the whole mix, but of the instruments versus the vocals. So there's a little bit of a space for the vocal to live in. That then goes to three faders, okay? These two, the vocals and the, and the, uh, and the instruments go to three faders. One is a compressor, okay? Unfortunately, you guys can't get this. Um, unless you're really good friends with George Massenburg and can I just say, any of you that are good friends, hey, Josiah, how you doing? Um, any, of those, any of those friends that are, that are uh, any of those people that are good friends with uh, George Massenburg, please write him a letter, say, release this, please. It's a fantastic compressor. There's nothing else that works like it. And I keep, you know, once a week, I'm telling George, release this, release this, he won't release it. He says it's not ready yet. Well, good enough for me. Um, anyway, so that's the compression track. And I just, as you can see, well, I do a lot of compression. Um, this is the main track. As you can see, there's nothing done to it. That is the digital mix in all its glory. This is the mix really compressed. And then I take those two faders. Let's go, let's see, go to here. These are my... VCA masters, each one is colored according to the color of the track. Again, uh, even if you don't like my mixes, you have to say that this is pretty, okay? So basically, uh, here's my compressor, okay? As you can see, that's about, oh, maybe 12 dB down from the main track. It's just enough to add a little bit of compression to what's going on to the main track. And then this, this guy here, 
um, is our old friend, the analog tape machine, okay? So we're adding just a little bit of that sucker in there. We're not doing a lot of it. We don't want to do a lot of it. If I wanted to do a lot of it, I'd have printed to it. But I'm just going to add a little bit to it, all right? So that guy goes in there. Bob's your uncle. Last stage of the mix is I've now... This is the part that may antagonize some purists. Um, don't know what to tell you. Um, except that this really works for me. And what that is, is I've divided the frequencies of the mix into four bands. Okay? Now the first band, as you can see, this is the first band. Alright? What I call the low frequency band. I have a a low pass, I mean a high pass at 43, and it goes up to 110. That's it, okay? The next one, as you can see, starts at 110, okay? So, theoretically, if you put these two together, it's a straight line, kind of. And then the next band is my high mids, this is my low mids, this is my high mids, and then the last band is the high frequencies. Now, someone can say, well, why don't you just use a multi-band compressor? Well, yeah, I could, but this gives me a lot more flexibility, okay? Because one, I have so much more control over this, but the other thing that this allows me is, unlike a multi-band compressor, I can put different compressors on each band. Now, I happen to love the way the Fatso works on the low band. Not so happy the way it works on the, uh, the low mid band. So, on the low mid band, I have a Fairchild, okay? I've never been, I always loved the way the Fairchild grabs the bass, but I've never liked the way it handles the low, low, low bass. So, this I get, I get Best of both worlds. I get the Fatso on the low bottom and on the mid bass, I got this guy. Then for the, the mid range, on this particular, the mid range and the high range change pretty, pretty often in the sense that on rock and roll, I'll use something like the Manly or something like that. On orchestral stuff, I'll use something maybe a little more transparent. I may even use a digital, uh, a digital uh, um, compressor. And uh, the same in the top end, this sometimes is a DBX-160, sometimes this is George's compressor, sometimes this is either something from Isotope 7, which has a vintage, it has either a vintage compressor or a limiter or uh, a digital. So that's basically the final stage, and then that gets sent to the mix track, which is over here. These are my... Let's close these guys up. Now, also, by the way, those frequencies will change. Orchestral stuff has a different range of, of uh, low, mid, high, because again, the frequencies are different. This is picked out for rock tracks, okay? But this, uh, now, this finally goes to the mix, and finally, in the mix stage, here's what I do. I print two mixes. Why do I print two mixes? Well, main reason is, because I like to mix without having to worry about how loud the fucking thing is. I mean, you know, you, you, you send these stuff out to your artist and they've been listening to a, a rough mix that was done by some kid in the studio and he just threw an L2 over the top of it and that's, that's the rough mix that they had and it's, it's screaming and loud and all that and then they play yours and it's minus 32 and they're saying it's not as, it doesn't hit me the same. Well, it would if you turned the level up, but they don't want to do that. So this is my mix right here. This is the main mix. This is, this is what I'm monitoring all the time, this guy right here. And if you go here, uh, and this is something that I use, and I really suggest everyone, if you do nothing else, get one of these or get something like it. This is called the Insight Meter, okay? This is made by Isotope, and what this does is it allows you to see 
exactly what's going on in terms of your loudness contours. Now, I have this, I have two settings. I have one here which is called minus 16. Whenever I mix, my main mix, I do not want it going below minus 16. The reason I don't want that is because once you go below minus 16, you're going to start compressing. Now, there will be areas of the song that may go as low as minus 14, but I never go below that. There are three numbers here. The first number is the, uh, the short-term loudness. The second number here is, the, uh, is the, the momentary maximum loudness. And this third number here um, is the loudness range, okay? So this number up here is going to show you the overall LUFS, which is the loudness units uh, scale that we use now for, uh, for audio uh, and also audio for film and for video. So now watch this meter, and I have these meters, I have a second screen, and these meters are on the second screen all the time. She's the kind of a girl you'd meet at a party. Get her behind closed doors and she gets naughty. Got a pack of wit as well as her body. God, I'm glad I came to this party. So you'll see, this is giving you obviously your, meet, your, your basic metering. So we're at minus 24, and then when we go to the chorus, we're, you know, see, like I say, I always stay, try to stay, certainly never below 14, but uh, it goes, you know, it'll go as, you know, somewhere between 14 and 16 is as loud as I want to get. And then you'll see the overall balance. By the time you get to the end of the song, this is your loudness units measurement. Now, for me, I don't want to go over 16, okay? Now, when we go to this one, Okay, I'm going to show you this one now. This is the one that we use for, this compares with a, a standard mastering, okay? Mastering tries to keep it between 10 and 12, okay? So I'm going to, we're going to go here and now you'll see the same mix, but now obviously it's much louder. Instead of starting out at 24, this is about 6 dB louder, okay? So I'll show you the difference here. So this will go down to minus 10. Even to 7. Well, actually, no. Down to 9, yeah. Again, I try to keep it between, uh, as, I, as 16 is my target for the main, for the main mix, um, 14 is as low as I want to go. As 10 is a target for the hot mix, uh, 8 is as much as I want to go. Let me show you that now. These two, if you go between these two, I'll show you that what I'm doing and what I'm using for mastering here, as I said, 6.5 dB. I'm using this uh, maximizer at 6.5 dB. Uh, I don't really use these first three. I love the fourth one. It gives me three really good choices. Um, one is classic, one is modern, don't use that much. And the other one is transient. Transient takes a lot more uh, processing, so I don't use that one as much. But basically, I stay between five and seven dB on, uh, on the maximizer. Um, the dynamics, they're in, but they're not really being used. You won't see that hitting hardly at all. And then, as you can see, ever so gently, a small EQ. Um, this is, so if you now go between, this is my mix. This is the, this is the mastered version, okay? Uh, now, what I've done here is there, let's see, this fader and this fader, okay? All right, so you will see that I have the fader set at two different levels. So I'm gonna switch between these two. She's the kind of a girl you'd meet at a party. Get her behind closed doors and she gets naughty. Got a pack of wit as well as her. God, 
I'm glad I came to so basically what I'm trying to do is make, but as you'll see, even though they sound pretty similar, you'll see that this one has added 6 dB again. She's the kind of a girl you'd meet at a party. Get her behind closed doors and she gets naughty. That's my main mix. Back for wit as well as her body. God, I'm glad I came. So that's basically, now I usually have them down so they're equal, so I'm, I make sure I'm not, but ba basically the ozone is giving me six and a half dB a gain, kind of for free. But, you know, what I don't want to do, I don't want to send that. If I was mastering the album, then I would play with that some more. But I don't want to send that to the mastering guy because he has no room to do anything. I'm, that now goes full scale, whereas my, you know, uh, whereas my mix goes a lot lower. Now, I know we're getting late, late on time, so I want, to do, I want to show you something really important. There's a few little things that you can do that make all the difference in the world without touching an EQ knob or a compressor, okay? And they're kind of magic, but, uh, and there's a lot of ways to do them, but they're really, really small, crucial things that I guarantee you will make every mix that you do sound better. There's a couple of devices. The first one that I'm gonna show you is called Auto Align. What is Auto Align? Auto Align is a plug-in that takes your track and aligns it with another track, okay? Now this is the snare drum with the, the under snare. Now if you can hear that, that's without it, okay? Oh, oh that was good. You hear how the bottom comes back? Listen to it now with the overheads. Okay, so now, if I take these out, can you hear the difference out there? Here's. Here. Hear how the bottom kind of bottom and the punch goes away? And if you're listening to it between the speakers, it's a massive difference, okay? Basically, all you do is you hit detect and it'll come up with, after a bit, it comes up with your delay. Now what that means is, it means that it's, it's delaying, okay, it's, it's bringing this track forward, which makes sense. 159 samples, now what's that in milliseconds? That's three milliseconds. Well, what do you know? The snare drum is here, the overhead is here, it's about three feet away, three milliseconds. Makes perfect sense, okay? But instead of having to do this and calculate it and do it by yourself, it does it by itself. Uh, same thing, I do the same thing with the bass, okay? Here's the bass DI, and here's the bass amp. Here how the bottom comes back and it goes away if you do this. See how thin it gets? So now, if you take this versus what I printed, this is what you'll get. And, those are, and all I've done is auto-align. Uh, wrong one.
God, I'm glad I came to this party. Oh. Gonna do what we know. Gonna dance the night away. Now, it's hard to believe, but those are the same level. Those two tracks, but one has just the bass drum, just the drums and the bass aligned, okay? And yet, it, it, yet it sounds really in your face as opposed to... Now, I know we're getting close on time, so I'm going to have to leave a lot of this. So I'm going to go now to the final session. Okay, so I'm going to play you this. Uh, I'll just show you uh, some of the effects. So anyway, wh what did I do? I looked at the song and said, I want to make each section its own thing. So first thing I decided to do was I wanted to make a bigger impact between the, this verse here and the chorus. So here's what I did. I changed the, I have a bunch of Echo Boy, which is one of my favorite uh, uh, effects plugins. A um, couple of great programs, apart from just the delays and stuff, is something called Echo Boy Hall, which you use on your vocals, you love it. So I, I have a bit of Echo Boy and Echo Boy Hall on the vocal and the verse, and then I thought the best thing to do would be to just stop it for a second to make the impact going into the chorus a little bit stronger. So this is what we got. Got a crack for wit as well as her body. God, I'm glad I came to this party. God, I'm glad I came to this party. Gonna do what we know. Gonna dance the night away. Now in this verse I wanted to do something else, so I added a bit of verb coming up here. So uh, now we then go to the guitar solo. By the way, if you look, there are some plugins on the drums, including the, the auto align, but the rest of it, that's it. Now here, when the vocals come in, I add a little subharmonic synth to the vocalist to give it more oomph. This is a whole new echo scheme here, again, which you don't hear a lot, but... Basically, the idea was, uh, there's a lot of different echo schemes. If you look at the, uh, here's the, if you look at these, faders here. These are the send faders to the various effects. As you can see, they've got uh, all kinds of rides and uh, things on them um, to, uh, uh, you know, to maximize and from section to section, like this one here. Stand. And the you know various understand there's points like it's just uh, you know there's all kinds of things going on that you're not really hearing but the, the the idea being 
let's let's try to take all of these sections, make it make it appear like a full, you know, like a band's playing it, but at the same time, not to call I don't want it to call attention to itself, but I just want it to add to your emotional enjoyment and your impact. Um, uh, a little bit of short shrift on the effect side, uh, but uh, basically that's, uh, let's see if there's anything else. Like I said, this is, except for the drums. Can we get a quick look at the effects that you're uh, using on those? Uh, oh yeah, buses? okay. So effects that I'm using, uh, well, let's see. We're using, uh, like I say, decap, well, we've gone through this, a decapitator and stuff here. Uh, then I'm using a bunch of UAD stuff. This is the Dimension D. Um, this is uh, the crystallizer, which I'm using on the vocals. Crystallizer has a great sound, which is a, a, reverse, uh, a reverse echo. It's, it's very cool. Um, and uh, let's see, then this one is my DDL. Basically, I do a delay, then I go into a filter, and then I add a little bit of distortion. Uh, this is E-Boy Hall, which I love on vocals. Uh, I like to put a lot of pre-delay on that, and it really sounds interesting. Um, the vocal, uh, I, now the vocal uh, EMT that I'm using from UAD, what I've done is it's one signal, one stereo signal, but I've divided it up into three. Uh, there's the low EMT, uh, which has a, uh, a quicker release time, and um, then the the top end of the the same the top end of the EMT. It's the same send, but then I have them going to two different EMTs for the top. A left one and the right one uh, are yeah. They're two different. They're two different uh, EMTs. Uh, one is delayed to the other, so it's the low end kind of comes here. The top end spreads out, um, so it gives it. It gives it a nice fill. Again, you won't hear that here, but you'd hear it uh, uh, in the room. Uh, this is a vocal. Uh, this is a vocal hall. Uh, let's see. Then I use the E boy on the guitars, the Echo Boy um, background chamber, and then uh, I'm using. Uh, I'm just making up a, a room. I'm using a non Lin for the drums. That's a two two four. Uh, this I use for the reverb for, what's that, DB, yeah, for the drums. Um, I'm using the voice of God to add a little bit of extra oomph to the guitars along with uh, a little EQ from our friends at Neve. Um, this is the saturation uh, that I send a couple things to, Cooper Time Cube, uh, MXR for a couple guitar effects. Uh, this is for low guitar effects, um, Echo Boy again, a lot of instances of Echo Boy. This is the reverb chamber for the band, and that's about it. Oh, M7, um, this is the IR uh, plugin. Um, it's a, uh, ah, hold on, hello? <laughs> hello? Elliot, Elliot Shiner calling, yeah. folks. <laughs> say, say, say hello to Elliot. Elliot, you're, uh, I'm doing a panel here, and your friends are uh, anxious to hear your thoughts. Who? We got friends here that are anxious to hear your thoughts on the panel. Okay, I'll call you back. I have a panel, but I'll call you back after the panel. I, I think I can speak for most of us when I say I could probably watch Frank do this Bye. all day. <laughs> Unfortunately, anyway. we do have to break down so that we can start the next one on time. All right. As ashamed as I am. Okay, so. so a big round of applause, everybody, for Frank Phil Bennett. All right, thank, thank you. So you. Frank. Sorry, and if you have we questions for Frank, you can meet him here at the front of the stage. Thank you so much.